Back in the summer of 2014, the NBA community had the privilege to witness one of the greatest draft classes in the past 20 years. Players such as Zach Levine, Joel Embiid, and Nikola Jokic were all selected and poised to make some noise in the NBA, but none of those players were deemed worthy enough at the time to be selected with the first overall pick. That title went to a 6'7 swingman out of Kansas named Andrew Wiggins. Now, Wiggins before the draft had very high and lofty expectations, projected to be the next great volume scoring wingman, getting compared to players such as Kobe Bryant and Tracy McGrady, and thanks to his seven foot wingspan, ridiculous bounce, and his Canadian ties, he even earned the nickname Maple Jordan. And to Wiggins' credit, early on in his career, he showed a lot of promise. At the end of his rookie campaign, he was named Rookie of the Year, and by the end of his third season, he was already averaging 24 points per game. Because of the improvements over the first three seasons, the Minnesota Timberwolves were prepared for Wiggins to take that final leap into NBA stardom, entering his fourth season. Actually, they were so committed that they handed Wiggins a max contract during the 2017 offseason, which did nothing more but inflate the expectations even higher for the 22-year-old and unfortunately, he missed the mark tremendously. Over the next couple of years, Andrew Wiggins was underwhelming to say the least, and with his max contract coming into effect during the 2018-2019 season, Wiggins quickly became one of the most overpaid players in the NBA. Minnesota eventually cut ties with their potential franchise star during the 2020 deadline as he was shipped to the Golden State Warriors, and this transaction was met with a lot of criticism on the side of Golden State. However, in the following season, a lot of things changed. Wiggins' production across the board became noticeably more efficient. He seemed extremely comfortable in a role where he was being featured alongside Steph Curry instead of trying to man an offense by himself. And now fast forward a few months later to where we are today, and honestly, I don't think too many people expected Andrew Wiggins to transform into the player that we see before our eyes as he has not only transformed his game completely, so much so that he is a major contributor to a Warriors team that is on a historic run early on this season, but also I would go as far as to say that Wiggins has quickly changed the narrative around his name from an overrated, overpaid, inefficient volume scorer to a legitimate all-star. And here's how he's been able to do that. The first aspect in Wiggins' game that was addressed when he made the move to Golden State was his scoring. Throughout his first few years in the NBA, Wiggins was known as a volume scorer, quickly in his second year being able to break through the 20 point per game barrier. And after his third season in the NBA, it seemed as if Wiggins was going to have several years in his career where he was going to be a 25 point per game scorer. But contrary to popular belief, Wiggins wasn't even doing this as great as many people originally believed. The biggest reason why I say that is because Wiggins was not an efficient scorer whatsoever. Within his time in Minnesota, Andrew Wiggins essentially was averaging 20 points per game, but unfortunately he had a true shooting percentage of roughly 52%, which was 3% below league average within that time frame. The biggest contributing factor to this unforgivable truth was the amount of mid-range shot attempts that Wiggins was committing to on a game-to-game -game basis. Now please do not get me confused for the hyper-analytic crowd, because I do understand the true value of a mid-range score, even if that shot is labeled as inefficient. But the problem with Wiggins wasn't just the amount of middies that he was attempting, it was also how accurate he was in the mid-range. On the screen right now, I have a simple infographic outlining what Wiggins was able to accomplish in a mid-range area on a year-to-year -year basis. Now, the two columns that you really need to pay attention to is his field goal percentage and his frequency. Because within his first four to five years in the NBA, essentially all of his time as a Minnesota Timberwolf, Andrew Wiggins on a year to year basis was shooting in the 30% range when it comes to his mid-range jumpers. And actually, outside of 2017, all of the rest of the seasons, he was shooting south of 35%. Also, if you slide over to the frequency column, you can clearly see within his first three to four years in the NBA, mid-range shots took up roughly a third of his shot selection diet. Just think about how crazy those numbers are. And if you don't understand how crazy they are, let me put some context in this for you. If we were to categorize a high volume mid-range scorer as someone who's attempting four middies a game, and then rank all of those qualifying players by their field goal percentage in the mid-range area, where would Wiggins rank on a year-to-year -year basis? Well, in the 2015 and 2016 seasons, 
Wiggins will rank dead last. In 2017, he would have the third worst field goal percentage amongst qualifying players. In 2018, he would have the second worst only in front of John Wall. And in 2019, again, he would have the second worst field goal percentage in the mid range area amongst qualifying players only in front of Russell Westbrook. Meaning that there is a very legitimate argument that within the first four to five years of Wiggins career, he was undoubtedly the worst mid-range scorer in the NBA. Now, personally, I do believe that this outcome is a direct symptom of being compared to players such as Tracy McGrady and Kobe Bryant. Because instead of Wiggins in Minnesota allowing Andrew Wiggins to be Andrew Wiggins, he was mirroring some of the greatest shot makers of all time which is easier said than done. And because of this, there was an immediate ceiling on what Andrew Wiggins could produce as an offensive piece to any team in the NBA. However, when he made his transition to the Golden State Warriors, all of that changed. Again, going back to the infographic that I pointed out earlier, as you can clearly see within the last three years, his accuracy still hasn't been able to eclipse the 40% mark, but what's more important is the rate of frequency has dropped tremendously. And what has replaced those terrible mid-range shots, you may ask? Well, three pointers. So far this season, Andrew Wiggins is attempting a career high on three point shots, averaging a little bit more than five a game and converting them at a rate of 43%, which is very impressive, especially coming from a player who entered the NBA and even ended his tenure in Minnesota with his three point shot being one of his biggest weaknesses in his offensive game. Because of the reduced Kobe imitation acts and the increase in three point shooting, not only has Andrew Wiggins become a noticeably more efficient ball player, so far this season he has a true shooting percentage of nearly 59% percent but also Wiggins is way more usable in an offense so far this season on catch and shoot jump shots Andrew Wiggins has an effective field goal percentage of 67.3 percent and amongst qualifying candidates players who have played 20 or more games and average at least three or more catch and shoot jump shots on a game to game basis Wiggins ranks in the top 95 percentile which easily makes him one of the most valuable catch and shoot players in the NBA with this new wrinkle in his game, not only does it mean that Wiggins is more impactful when he's off ball, but even when he's interacting in certain offensive sets, the defense has to play him completely different with him being a legitimate three-point threat now. And to be transparent, of course, having a teammate like Draymond Green or Steph Curry will definitely aid you in many ways offensively. With a level of attention that Curry demands on and off ball and the playmaking from Draymond that we see on a night-to-night -night basis, Andrew Wiggins' new style of play fits perfectly with this roster as a second or third scoring option. Also, Wiggins still uses his ability to create his own shot from time to time, more specifically on step back jump shots in which he's converting those at a 55% rate, which is incredibly impressive. And even when he doesn't make the shot, he consistently can create enough space for him to get a quality look. Because of all of these dynamics and level of efficiency, Wiggins is a bit better than the Harrison Barnes 2.0 role that many people placed upon him before the beginning of the season offensively. And on the other side of the floor, he's exceeding expectations even more. Defensively, due to his size, frame, and athleticism, Wiggins is perfect on the switch, especially on taller ball handlers. In the post, Wiggins doesn't give up that much position, and even when he does, he still makes it really difficult, again due to his length, on fadeaway jumpers. But what has Wiggins really excelled at is being a nightmare defensively for smaller guards. The speed and quickness that most smaller guards have the use of their advantage is nearly completely neutralized when Wiggins is defending them, and even when there are times when Wiggins gets beat off the dribble, he still stays as close as possible to the ball handler with great hustle and still comes up with a late contest. Also in pick and roll situations, Wiggins does a really good job at staying fundamentally sound, keeping his hand up in the passing lanes, and completely deterring the opposing ball handler from passing the ball to the rolling big man. Another way that he uses his length to his advantage is by blitzing the ball handler, especially when the pick is being set near the out of bounds line, and this even works against taller ball handlers. Now, to be completely clear here, I am not saying that Wiggins has been so great defensively that he should make an all defensive team. The biggest problem with Wiggins is his consistency, especially in terms of maneuvering around pick and rolls. Wiggins just doesn't do that consistently enough to be an elite point of attack defender. And to be completely transparent, having someone like Draymond Green on your team will definitely make you look even better than you normally do. However, I have to give credit where credit is due. Wiggins defensively looks much better now than he did back in his Minnesota years, which was always a concern because someone with that level of frame, athleticism, lateral quickness, wingspan, has all of the physical tools and traits to be at best an above average defender, but unfortunately, that's just not how many people would categorize Wiggins back in Minnesota. 
And because of all of his improvements so far this season, I do believe that there is a legitimate argument that Wiggins should be an all-star this year. Because when you take into account that Wiggins is the second scoring option on the best team in the NBA, and defensively, I would easily argue he has been a noticeable positive for this team. And furthermore, when you look at the Western Conference, there's a lot of teams that are underperforming. Three or four teams in a playoff picture are at best slightly above 500. And two front court players in Anthony Davis and Paul George will more than likely miss a month of basketball. I do believe that it's pretty obvious that Wiggins should be at least taken to legitimate consideration to be an all-star. And in my opinion, at worst, regardless if he makes it or not, he certainly is playing at that level so far this year. And a lot of that just comes down to Andrew Wiggins being Andrew Wiggins, which I believe is a huge plight for a lot of young prospects coming into the NBA, trying to meet the standards that everybody else have placed upon them. But shout out to Andrew Wiggins and shout out to the Golden State Warriors for looking at him for who he is as a player, taking him on as a clean slate and molding him into what best benefits not only his play, but also for what the Golden State Warriors need as a franchise. But hey, those are just my thoughts. Please let me know what you think about the video in the comment section below. The all-star voting has already began for fans, so make sure your voice is heard. I'm not telling you you gotta vote for Andrew Wiggins, but I do believe that he should receive some legitimate consideration. And until next time, I'll see you all later. Peace.